rises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. And strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong It's wonderful to hear you guys singing with us. There's a song we did a couple weeks ago that you, we did it a little differently. It's called Reason I Sing. I encourage y'all to look it up. It's Phil Wickham. But I know, you know, of course, I love singing worship music, right? And But I, I love when we get to hear you guys singing with us. And this song, to me, the words to this song is a reminder of why it's so important that we lift up our voices in praise for all the things that he's done for us. So as you guys are kind of singing along and learning this song with us, I encourage you guys once again, just look at these words and remember this is the reason that we sing.
For the cross that you bore and the debt that you paid For the victory you've won over death and the grave This is the reason I sing For the hope that you give and the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me This is the reason I sing forever my song will be you only for you for the cross that you bore and the debt that you paid for the victory you've won over death and the grave this is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me. This is the reason I sing. So good. So good. So good. You're so good to me. Sing it this morning. It's beautiful. Forever I'll sing. You're so good to me. So good, so good, you're so good to me, forever I'll sing, you're so good to me. For the cross that you bore and the debt that you paid, for the victory you've won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing For the hope that you give And the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me Oh, this is the reason I sing For the cross that you bore And the debt that you paid For the victory you've won over death and the grave This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason i sing jesus the reason i sing You guys sounded awesome this morning and as we're going to just continue just thinking about why we lift up our voices as we just think about how he just gives us his love so freely and so completely so keep that keep that singing going keep that praising going this morning as we go into this next song you are my shepherd i shall not want you make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside still water. You restore my soul. Though I walk through the valley, I won't fear death's shadow because I In the banner that's over me Is a love that has set me free You lavish your love Lavish your love on me And your love conquers all my fears Because Jesus, you're always you lavish your love, lavish your love on me. Pour out 
Let your spirit till I overflow with peace in the midst of my trouble. Get more than enough for my struggle. Yeah, you're all I need. And though I walk through the valley, I won't fear death's shadow because You're always near. You lavish your love, lavish your love on me. What goodness and mercy will follow me all the my days? I'll make my home in your presence now and always. Goodness and mercy will follow me all of my days. And I'll make my home in your presence now and always. And the banner that's over me is a love that has set me free. Your love, love is your love on me, and your love conquers all my fears because Jesus, you're always near. You love is your love, love is your love on me. Yes, you love. Lavish your love, lavish your love on me. Yes, you lavish your love, lavish your love on me. You may be seated. Good morning. Oh, we serve a God who is not afraid to like just lavish his love there's not he's not holding back he's not just giving it to us when we deserve it he just pours it out on us just completely and wholeheartedly every single day and that is awesome that's an awesome thought to wake up to every morning but good morning we're glad to have all of you guys here this morning welcome to those of you joining us online um, this is a busy month so I'm gonna go ahead and turn your attention to the screen so we can check out what's going on good morning Hope you're all doing well today. My name is Sam and I have a few announcements for you today. Let's get right into those tonight at four o'clock. Right here in the sanctuary, we're gonna be having a town hall meeting discussing the future of the church. It's very important that you be here for that. Make sure you're there. Four o'clock, we got a lot of information to share with you uh, and you're not gonna to wanna to miss it. So again, four o'clock in this room, we'll see you there. Then October 2nd, again, we have our Magnum Opus event. A lot of you signed up last week. Thank you so much for going out and doing that. If you haven't signed up, again, I guarantee you there is something for you to do at this event. It is going to be amazing and you are going to want to be a part of this. We're going to make a gigantic impact on For the Children. It's going to be honestly amazing. I know I've said that a few times, but I, I have no other words for it. It's going to be an amazing event and we hope that you will all join us for that. We need 120 people. That list is filling up out there. Don't worry, there's more lists underneath it. There's a spot for you. If you want to work it, we can put you in a spot where you will be vital. So make sure you sign up for that today. Then, speaking of signing up, on October 31st, we are having our fall festival and we need volunteers. We've got a few things planned for that. If you're interested in helping out with the fall festival, make sure you contact Ross Pittman here at this email address. You'd love to have a discussion with you and see how you can get involved with that. 
I believe that is all I have for you today. So make sure you get connected with us on our Facebook page, website, Instagram, YouTube, all of those things. Download our app, Google Play Store, Apple App Store. You know which one to go to. I've got nothing left. So, as always, we'll see you next week. You're here today as we are here in worship. Welcome. If you're joining us online, we're so glad. And again, I want to add my words of welcome to you too. Um, we want to pray for you. We want you to let us know how we can do that. Several ways you can do that. If you're joining us online, there's a link up under the, the live feed that you can click on. You can send in your prayer request to us. Uh, uh, if you picked up a bulletin as you were coming in, there's this little slip of paper that's in your bulletin. Everybody can fill out the top part. The bottom part is where you can let us know what your prayer request is. You can drop that in the offering basket as you leave here in just a few minutes. After, uh, In addition to that, if you didn't get your bulletin in the back of the seats, there's this little slip of paper. You can grab that out of the back of the seat pouch there. Fill it out, drop it in the offering basket when you leave here in a few moments. Uh, you can also go to our Woodbine app. There's a link that you can send in a prayer request. And then you can tell any one of us on staff. There is a host of ways you can let us know how we can pray for you. We want to do that, so let us know. Uh, we have some prayer requests uh, before... Um, I want to just share with you a few of these prayer requests. Continue to pray for the magnum opus. That's only about three weeks away, uh, three or four weeks away. It's coming, October the 2nd. And be in prayer for that. We believe God's going to do some great things through that uh, great event. Uh, if you are, have not been with us for one of these kind of Sundays, what we do, we meet in here at 9 o'clock. And we have a very brief service, have communion, and then we take off, okay? And we go work. We call off our services here, and we go out and be the church in the community. So be uh, with us in that. We invite you to come and be a part of it. Continue to pray for Chuck Timms. He has uh, finished a lot of tests. He's going to be speaking with the doctors to get a prognosis and, uh, and a uh, treatment plan for what, he has, uh, what they have found. So be in prayer for Chuck and for Ann and lifting them up. And then in your bulletin, again, well, you, and Sam mentioned it, but there's this little slip of paper about the town hall meeting this afternoon. Uh, that's going to be at 4 o'clock right here. Be in prayer for that as the church is discerning the future of uh, the church here. So we really would like to invite everybody to come. You do not have to be a member. Um, all you have to do is be breathing. All right, and you can come to the meeting. So if you have any interest in the future of Woodbine Church, we invite you to be a part of that meeting this afternoon in here at 4 o'clock. Um, for our prayer time today, I thought about doing something different. As I was coming into the service um, or, <clears throat> or outside getting ready to come in, uh, I said, Lord, what, what direction do you want me to pray? How would you like for us to do this this morning? We have prayer requests. We have all of that. So what direction do you want to go? And then the answer came as we were singing that last song. I want us to pray through Psalm 23 right now. So if you would like to slip out of your seat and come down to the altar, I'm going to stand right here today. I usually kneel, but I need to hold the Bible up and, and look at it. But I'm going to just read through that, that, those verses. And, and I want to invite you. I may pause. I may say something in between them. But I want to invite you to just focus about the Lord being your shepherd. So let's be in a spirit of prayer. Father, as we read your word, we pray that you would just speak to our hearts and enlighten us. We pray that you would draw us ever closer to you as we focus on what you say. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Will you pause for a minute and give God thanks for the blessings he has given to you and the needs he has met in your life. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Are you feeling weary today? In Christ, you can find peace. And your soul can be restored no matter what has gone on before.
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You feel like you've been there before? Maybe you feel like you're there now. This oppression, this turmoil, this pain. The psalmist says, I will fear no evil. Even going through the valley of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because, God, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Take just a moment and realize that you're not alone. God is your protector. He's your provider. He is with you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. No matter where we are or what we're going through, we have been blessed so greatly by our loving and caring God. What about where we're going? The psalmist writes, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. God is so good to us. He's blessed us beyond measure. No matter where we are in our life, He has given us the opportunity to enjoy this life. And He is our good shepherd. And He takes care of His sheep. Thank you so much for how you support the ministry of the church. If you brought an offering with you today, the um, uh, offering baskets are in the... um, As you exit the doors, you'll see the offering baskets there. You can leave your offering there. If you uh, would like to give through the giving app uh, or through the um, church app, you can give that way. There's a text give number in your bulletin. However you give, we want to thank you for continuing to support the ministry and the outreach of Woodbine Church here in this community. Thank you so much. At this time, we want to dismiss our youth to find Trey uh, out in the back in the atrium. Not out in the back, but back of the church there. And uh, let them enjoy their life group. Let's continue with our service. spark I call you healer you can mend any broken heart I call you faithful father you finish everything you start my soul was made to respond I know you by a thousand names and you deserve every single one You've given me a million ways to be amazed at what you've done. And I am lost in wonder at all you do. I know you by a thousand names, and I'll sing them back to you. Grace is patient. You never give up on me. I call you bondage breaker. Cause you're handing out the prison keys. My soul was made 
to be free. I know you by a thousand names, and you deserve every single one. You've given me a million ways to be amazed at what you've done, and I am lost in wonder at all you do. I know you by a thousand names. And I'll sing them back, I'll sing them back to you. You are rock of ages, you're the great I am. You are king forever. The beginning and the end, you are Lord and servant, you're the son of man, you're the lion of Judah, you're the risen lamb, you're the second Adam, here to lead us home, you are Yahweh's glory. Now revealed in flesh and bone, you are ocean potter, you will make a way, you are death defeater, you have risen from the grave, you are full of mercy, you're rich in love, you're Jesus, Messiah, the true God. I know you by a thousand names, and you deserve every single one. You've given me a million ways to be amazed at what you've done, and I am lost in wonder at all you do. I know you by a thousand names, and I'll sing them back to you. you are to us, Father, because of the way that you love us, the sacrifice that you made that we could be with you forever. Lord, we have such a, a wonderful opportunity to just lift up your name in praise and, and just to, to constantly be reminded of all that you are, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your love for us. We thank you that it is unfailing, that it will never waver, that there's nothing that we can do to separate that love from us, Lord. So now we just, once again, just thank you for this time of worship. And now we also thank you, Lord, for the word that you put on the heart of our pastor. We just ask that each person that will hear it, Father, will be moved, will be changed, will be emboldened, will be encouraged, Lord. Just whatever, whatever the hearer needs, Lord, that they will hear from you today. We, we just claim that, Lord. We know that is exactly why you've put this word on Jimmy's heart today. So, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you have in store for us. And we ask for your blessings in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Um, I forgot to share something about the meeting this afternoon. If you need child care for your little ones, we do have that available for you for the meeting. So I forgot to share that, but want to make sure I shared that now. Um, <clears throat> well, we only have one more lesson after today as we're talking about the next generation faith and believe it or not the next generation is listening they may not look like it they may not act like it sometimes but they are listening you know how I know that it's because you and I whenever we were their age we did the same thing didn't we I mean let's be honest we acted like we weren't listening, but have you ever, now that you're grown, have you ever, guys, have you ever said something and heard your dad's voice coming out of your mouth? Or ladies, have you ever heard, said something and heard your mom or dad's voice coming out of your mouth? It's like, 
where'd that come from? You know, it's because whenever we didn't think we were listening, we were listening. So uh, I want us to realize as we speak, the next generation is listening. So what we have to say is important. Now, I decided to be a little nostalgic today, and I know everybody, you know, we all love our, our cell phones and all that. I decided I wanted to go back and get a picture of my very first mobile phone. And I did, and here it is. <laughs> Any of y'all ever remember playing with those things? And most of the time, all you hear was, <laughs> but it's about like what I hear sometimes on my phone now. Uh, but that was my very first mobile phone. Now, almost everybody has a smartphone. Uh, they have a phone where you can text, you can talk, you can tweet, you can look at the internet and download music almost all at the same time. And we, we really are connected, right? I mean, we're really connected, but it seems like in relationships, our relationships are becoming more disconnected than ever before. Possibly the greatest cause of conflict and confusion in marriages and families and in the workplace today is a breakdown in communication. And even though we all have these devices to help us communicate, we, very few people really communicate on a deep level. And the lines of communication, they're really breaking down between husbands and wives and between parents and children, between our co-workers, between bosses and employees, between students and teachers. And it seems like these, these areas, there's just this breakdown in communication in so many places. And it seems like very few people are really connecting on a deep level. So as we talk about communication, what I'd like for us to do today, I would like for us to really focus on the people who are closest to us. Because you can't impact the world until you impact the people around you. It's great to have these lofty goals to go out and do all these great things in the world. But if you go off and do that and you forget the people that are closest to you, you're actually failing. You know, I like to, uh, you know, think about, you know, one day I I'm going to retire. Uh, 100, 150 years, whatever. Uh, I'm going to retire. I'll, I'll, I will no longer be a pastor. And my identity cannot just be being a pastor, because if that's all it is, when I retire, my family is going to suffer even more. But not only that, the, you know, I, I, I need to realize that if something were to happen and I had to stop being a pastor today, if it was all over today, what I would continue to have around me for the rest of my life would be my family. My wife, my kids, my grandkids. And what would happen if I am not figuring out how to communicate with them now? I need to, you know, it's going to be tough then. But the other thing I need to realize is one day the work will be done. All the work that I can do will be over. And all I will have left would be the most important work that I should have done. And that is caring for my family. And making sure I stay connected with them. We can't skip over our family and change the world or we will lose our power and our influence to make a difference in the world. See, there are too many people, they're living with their lives out of order. They're, they're looking for their hope and their joy and their fulfillment without first looking to God. My call is to this church. I have no doubt about that. I don't question that because God has confirmed that in so many ways. My call is to this church. But before my call to Woodbine is my call to my family. 
And before my call is to my kids and to my grandkids, my call is to my wife, Anita. And before my call is to my wife, Anita, my call is to God. And we can't get those things out of order. I can't get those things out of order in my life. And if I keep things in that kind of order, if I keep it with God, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, and my church, that doesn't mean the church is unimportant, but that in my list of priorities, the first thing has to be God, and He takes care of everything else down that list. See, our enemy is Satan, and he knows that if he can use communication breakdowns in marriage or a family or at work or in a relationship, then he can destroy that relationship. Satan is always working to destroy the communication between us. He tries to interfere with me and my wife. He tries to interfere with me and my kids. He tries to interfere with me and my grandkids. He tries to interfere with me and you. He tries to interfere. He tries to invade. He tries to interrupt this communication that we need to have. So I, wanna, I want you to think for, for a moment. I want you to think about the most important relationships in your life. Think about what they are. Is there a relationship in your life right now? You know that whenever I said think about the most important ones, it, something came to you. So my question is, is there any relationship in your life right now where you're having a communication breakdown? Doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't ma seem to matter what word you use. You're just not getting through. And it's not about the words because billions of words are spoken every day. In homes, in schools, in offices. It's not really about all of those words. I want to invite us to focus on one word. On the word. I want to invite us for a few minutes to focus on Jesus Christ. I love what John writes. I mean, John, this, this is one of my favorite books. It's in my top 66. I mean... But it's, uh, it's right there at the top of my 66. I love the Gospel of John. It said the, and look, look what John wrote in John 1.14. It says, the Word, and he's talking about Jesus. He said, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. I want you to think about that. Christ broke through to us so that he could communicate to us his love very clearly and very effectively and very powerfully. And if you and I, if we want to have a communication breakthrough, then there are some principles that we need to put in practice. There are, I'm sure there are a lot of them out there. I'm only going to talk about three today. The first principle is this. Before I open my mouth... I must open my heart. Before I say a word, I need to have my heart revealed. You see, that's exactly what Jesus did for us. John tells us that Jesus became flesh. The word became flesh. Don't miss this. The God of the universe, the all-powerful, all-perfect, with, without any needs in this entire universe, that God, he comes to earth, he puts on a suit of frail, vulnerable human flesh, and he becomes one of us. We cannot say to Jesus, you don't know how it is here. You know, Jesus could then say, really? I got something right here that you might want to look at. They, they th drove a nail through my hands. I kind of know how it can get tough. He became one of us. 
He became flesh. And not only does he become one of us, he enters this world in the most vulnerable way possible. He enters as a tiny baby, totally dependent on a human mom and a human dad. Talk about pressure. Mary and Joseph raising God's son? That's a lot of pressure. They lost him when he was 12 for a day or two. It, can you imagine going to God and said, uh, <laughs> Father, <laughs> we lost Jesus. Can you imagine that? But this precious bundle, God in the flesh was dependent on a human mom and a human dad. Why did he do that? The reason he did that is very simple, because he wanted us to see his heart. God became a tiny, vulnerable, frail baby so he could reveal his heart to us and we could see what God is like. And that means for us that if I'm going to have a breakthrough in my life, I have to stop hiding my humanness. I, I can't pretend like I've got it all together. I, I can't hide my weaknesses. I, I have to admit my needs and my hurts and my mistakes. Have you ever been around a perfect person? Don't, don't point at anybody. But have you ever done that? You ever been around somebody who's perfect? You know, they seem like they don't have any problems. They seem like they got it all together. They seem like everything is going just great. They seem like they have no worries. They seem like they have no sin. They seem like they have nothing going on. Aren't those people disgusting? They're not like the rest of us, are they? And let's face it, guys, it's really hard for us to be vulnerable and talk about our hurts and our needs a lot because we don't really want to do that. We don't want to get mushy. If it starts getting a little too mushy, we're going we're gonna to talk about football, hunting, NASCAR, anything. If it gets really bad, we're going to talk about cage fighting. I mean, we're going to do something to get away from the... Revealing of our hearts. And let's face it, that's how we've been conditioned. We act as though we don't need to talk about that. But both men and women, we've got to realize that if we want to truly connect with God, then we've got to be real with God. And it's amazing to me that we run around with our pain and we run around with our hurt and we act as if we have to handle everything all on our own. We act as though our stuff is too big for God or that we're going to shock him or that if we are truly real with God that there's absolutely no way God would ever love us anymore. If you believe that, if you believe that you can do something so bad that God would never love you anymore, if you believe that he's not concerned with your hurts and your pains, if you believe any of that, then you do not have, a, 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 you do not have an, any understanding of who God is at all. How many times in the Word does he have to tell us to come to him? He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, he says. So I want to invite you, friends, if you want to really get into it, take your relationship with God to another level, then start communicating honestly with him. He already knows the truth. He's just waiting on you to talk to him about it. God's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. He's going to allow you to reveal your deepest needs to him, even though he already knows it. He, he's not going to try to force his way into your life. He invites you to invite him in. So how do you do that? How do you get real with God? You can't reveal your heart, your, your hurt. Excuse me, you can't reveal your heart unless you reveal your hurt. And the reason most people don't share their hurts, you know why? Because of pride. It's because of pride. We don't want to share with our friends that we need prayer when we are struggling with something because we're afraid of what they may think. 
We don't want to let them in on certain things because we're afraid that we may become the talking point of the next gossip section, session with somebody. We're afraid that if we reveal too much about ourselves, we may lose our friends. We, we are afraid that if, we, listen, that we're afraid of what they may think. We're afraid that they may realize that we're not perfect. Newsflash, they already know you're not perfect. You know how they know you're not perfect because they're not perfect. Now, I don't think you ought to just go up to a perfect stranger and say, hey, listen, let me tell you what I'm dealing with today. I mean, sometimes God leads you to that, or sometimes God leads somebody to you about that, but you find that trusted friend. You find those people that you want to be the closest with, and you find a way to reveal yourself and, and open yourself to hearing from them. I've got people like that in my life. Had them in my life for a long time. And no matter what I've ever said to them, they've never, ever turned away from me. And they don't look at me any different. That's a true friend. They also don't put up with my junk. That's a true friend. See, we don't want to share with God because we think that we should not bother Him or that our stuff is too petty or too small for Him to really care about that or that our stuff is too big for Him to forgive. Newsflash, if you believe that, you don't understand anything about God. Stop hiding behind your pride. And if you don't have that person you want to talk to where you can reveal your heart there, start revealing your heart to God, just laying it out before Him. Start calling out to Him. Start crying out to Him. Start being real with Him. I've never gotten tired of my kids talking to me. Anita does not get tired of our kids talking to her. We don't get tired of them communicating with us. So if we frail, imperfect parents, earthly parents, don't get tired of our kids telling us about what they're struggling with. Do you think our Heavenly Father would get tired of us telling Him what we struggle with? Are you telling Him what you struggle with? No. He, will, he loves you. It's not based on you. It's based on Him. His love has never been based on what you can or cannot do because none of us are that good. His love is always based on His goodness, not ours. Have you ever noticed how little kids can't hide their feelings? You ever notice that? Have you, have you ever noticed, I mean, you know, whatever it is, whatever is in their heart just comes out on their face. I mean, you think about it. You, you, you know when a little child is mad, don't you? Well, you don't? Well, hang around a five-year-old for a couple of minutes. You'll figure it out. You, you know when they're upset. You know when they're sad. You're going to see them crying. You, you know when they're excited. It's all over their face. Whatever is here is coming out here. But as adults, we learn to hide our emotions so that you can't tell what's really going on by our facial expressions. If you don't believe that, just think. You, you've just gone through a hard whatever. You pick whatever the issue you're in. Maybe it's a bad phone call, maybe it's an argument, maybe it's something else, and then you walk away. Maybe it happened at work, and you walk away from that, and you're walking down through there, and you see another coworker coming towards you, and they say to you, how are you? What do you say back to them? I'm good. I'm fine. And we put on our fake smile, and we, we hide whatever it is we're dealing with. Why do we hesitate to share our feelings? I believe it's because we're scared of being rejected. Nobody wants to be rejected. Nobody wants to be wounded. And we're scared of that. You can, you can impress people with your success, but you're, you influence people when you admit your weaknesses, your failures, and your mistakes. Don't hide from your humanness. 
don't be afraid. Notice what John writes in, in 1 John. He says this, there's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is not yet one, is, is one not yet fully formed in love. Fear comes in and tries to take the place of love in our lives. And the fear of rejection can be crippling. It, it keeps you from risking revealing your heart, but love banishes fear. See, real love, it requires risk, and that's why God gave us this powerful thing he calls free will. He created you to love you as an object of his love, but yet he gave you the power to reject him. God made you so that he could love you and be in a relationship with you. And love is not love unless you have the power to reject that love. He gave us this power to curse his name. He gave us the power to believe that he doesn't exist. He gave us the power to push him away and say, no, I don't want anything to do with you. And the reason he gave us that power is so that we could make the choice to love him. Why would he do that? Because he wants you to love him because you want to love him. And that's when it's love. It's not when you're forced to love. It's not, it, love is not love unless it, unless it risks rejection. And the scariest thing you'll ever do in your life is to really risk revealing your heart and loving another person. And it's the only way, though, you can have a breakthrough in communication. It's the only way you will truly find your voice. You've got to learn to risk. So take the risk because the next generation is watching. Your kids know if you're faking it around other people. They know. We're teaching our next generation. So take the risk. Ask someone for forgiveness that you hurt. Forgi offer forgiveness to someone who's hurt you. See, we don't like to admit we're hurt, but you have to reveal your hurt. And God revealed his heart to us. And if I'm going to have a breakthrough, before I open my mouth, I need to open my heart. And the next thing I need to do is this. I need to move into their world. That's exactly what Jesus did. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. God left his throne, his kingdom, in perfect paradise, and he came down to a broken, sin-sick world, and he made his dwelling among us. I love how the message puts John 1.14. Look at how it says. It's, 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 this paraphrase says, The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. I love that picture. Jesus is in the hood. The Word became flesh and moved to where we are. He moved into our lives. He moved into the place where we lived. He came to earth. He didn't bring earth up to Him. He came down here because He knew we couldn't get to Him. God came right into our mess so that we could clearly hear His message. And if you want someone to hear your message of love, you've got to be willing to move into their mess. You've got to move into their world. Nate and I, for eight years, we were a part of a ministry in Opelika to college students. We ran that ministry from the, at the church. And we developed this thing, and I don't know for how many years we did this, but we had, this, we had evening services at the church. And after church, we invited all the kids all the youth, uh, the, the college kids, not all the youth, <laughs> we all the college kids to come over to our house to eat supper. We, call, we were very creative, creative. We called it snack 
Sunday night after church. You know, we're real creative. And we called it that, and, and, and the word spread. And we've had upwards of 50 college students in our house. You know how hard it is to get 50 college students in a 1,600-square-foot house? Yeah. With, and fed them and hung out. And, and we did all of that, and we, we had a good time. We would leave church, and we'd have our lunch. And then my wife, and she didn't, you know, every now and then she'd let me order pizza, but most of the time she wanted to give these kids a home-cooked meal, which means I was her sous chef. You know, she, whatever she told me to do, I went and did it, you know. And she'd cook this meal, and, and I found this out in our first meeting. College kids can eat. Holy cow! I mean, they, they, especially 50 of them. I mean, they, and it's like, I don't think the boys ate for a week before they got to our house. Because while the girls might pick at it a little bit, the boys did not pick at anything. They just, you know, ate it. It was fun. We loved having them over there. It was, it was a blast. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to get into their world. We wanted to move into what they were dealing with. And we would do whatever it took to get into their world. And when we got into their world, you know what we noticed? They wanted to be in our world. I mean, we dealt with a whole lot of things. First thing we dealt with is they were Auburn students. I mean, that was really hard. I had to work through that one, pray through it a lot. But after that, uh, you know, we dealt, with, we dealt with some hard issues as we talked with them. And listen, we dealt with eating disorders. We dealt with family issues. We dealt with sexual temptations. We dealt with relationship problems. We talked to them about sin and salvation. And it worked. We got into their world. And they got into our world. You know what? They loved our kids. And instead, of, we didn't take our kids and put them off in a room somewhere. Our kids were in the midst of 50 college students. And, and those college students loved hanging around our kids. And our kids thought they were grown, you know, hanging around them. I mean, they loved it. We had college students at our house sometimes till 3 in the morning. Sometimes they were playing games. Sometimes they were pouring out their heart. And because of that, I mean, listen, sometimes they'd fall asleep on, church, on, on our couch. I remember one young lady, she was there, and everybody was there. The house was packed. She reached back. She grabbed the African off the back of the couch, and on the end of the couch, she balled up, covered up with, the, with an African. Lights out. She was gone. <laughs> with all this going on, she was in the corner of that couch just sleeping. You know why she could do that? It wasn't because she was, just because she was tired. It's because we had moved into her world. We allowed her to move into ours, and we moved into hers. And she felt comfortable right there on the end of the couch, curled up under an afghan my wife had made, sleeping. You know, we still have connections with a lot of those kids. I know right now there are kids, uh, we have kids that we could, connect, we could call, we could email, we could text, we could do whatever, and we could say, hey, we need you, and they would be here. I don't know how many uh, uh, weddings from that group that I have either done or been to. Matter of fact, some even met their future spouse at our house. That was not the intent of snack, but it happened. We were in their wedding. See, God came to us. He didn't wait for us to go to Him. He came for us. He didn't wait for us to work our way up to Him. He came to us right in the middle of our mess so that we, He could clearly communicate His message of love and hope and forgiveness. And see, the big problem with a lot of people is that they have a no trespassing sign over their heart. We're ever going to be able to communicate faith to the next generation, we must first receive the message of faith into our own hearts. When we allow God to move into our world, then we can have more freedom to move into others' world.
and share that message of hope that he's given to us. We need to move into their world. The other thing we need to do is speak and act in grace and truth. John writes the word was full of grace and truth. Christ communicated to us in a way that was full of this grace and truth. And many times as we communicate, we're full of something, but not necessarily grace and truth. What is grace? Let me tell you what grace is. Grace is giving someone what they could never deserve. That's exactly what God did for us. He gave us something that we could never deserve. He gave us salvation. He gave us heaven. He gave it to us as a free gift. He gave that grace to us. And whenever we have received that grace, listen, if you're a Christ follower, I'm really talking to you and me right now. Listen, you need to hear this. If we have received that grace, we need to extend that grace. Listen. I get that there's sometimes somebody comes up to you and you want to knock them out. I get that. Well, maybe you don't, but I know of some people who want to do that. But grace is not giving someone what they deserve. It's giving them something that they could never deserve. And we need to give grace to people. We need to do acts of kindness for people. If you want a breakthrough, then do acts of kindness and expect nothing in return. So I want to invite you this week to do that. Some people are always loving people with strings attached. I I will love you if you'll love me back. I will meet your needs if you meet my needs. I'll do this, and I will expect something in return from you. And when you, listen, when you love with no strings attached, you're loving like Jesus. That's grace. And you know, you and I both know, when we're loving... With no strings attached. You can't go around. This is just an example. You can't go around Pensacola. And some places in Pace. Without seeing somebody out on. At a stop sign or a red light. Hold up a sign. You know what I'm talking about? Hungry. Anything will do. God bless you. Now, I don't know if you go. And ever go and buy folks like that some food or give them a couple of bucks. It's my policy and my, 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 my conviction that if somebody's hungry, I want to feed them. I don't mind buying them food. I, I don't mind doing that. But you know what? I can't go and do that with the wrong heart. I can't go and buy them food. You know, God, hey, you need to go buy them food. Okay, God, I'll go do that. But they could get out and get a job. They shouldn't be so lazy. They probably don't even need this. They probably have a Cadillac parked somewhere away from here from all the money they've made off of just doing this. I can't have that kind of attitude. You know what? When God speaks to me and he says, go and do this for this person, it's none of my business. Where they have been, what they have done, how they have acted, whether they need it or not. When God speaks, my voice, my, my only answer should be, yes, Lord, now what? So when God speaks to me about giving something, I, I go and I'll, I'll give them the meal, and, I, and I'll say, hey, can I pray with you? I don't drive up, roll down the window, and say, here you go, and take off. I don't do a drive-by burger, you know. I park my truck, I go, I hand it to them, and I say, hey, I get, to know, I get their name, and I say, hey, can I pray for you? I want to extend grace. Because there, but by the grace of God, could be me. And how would I want people to treat me if I were in that need? The other part of grace is truth. To really find your voice and be able to speak into the next generation, you've got to share the truth.
you want to build up trust, you've got to learn to share the truth. You can share the truth that's found in this book with love, with grace. But I'm here to tell you, don't change it to make the other person feel good because then you're sinning. You're not rightly sharing the word of God. See, when I counsel someone, uh, I I will sometimes tell them that I need to tell them something. And I'll tell them before I say it, you're not going to like it. You're not. But it's the truth. And you need to hear it. We have to learn to share the truth. I will always share the truth from God's word. And it may not be popular. I'm cool with that. I'm really, I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what it says. So I'm cool with it. I've said this before. If you've got a problem with what the Bible says, you need to take it up with the author. That ain't me. He's not going to change it, by the way. <clears throat> Let's give you a heads up there. Sharing the truth may not be the end thing, but I'm going to share the truth. We don't take polls about what's popular. The truth is not determined by vote or by popularity. We need to share the truth. And I want to share it with you. Here it is. The truth is, people all around you are hurting. The truth is, people all around you are feeling like there is no hope. The truth is, people all around us feel like their life is in the toilet and nobody cares. The truth is, families are in trouble and they feel like they have nowhere to turn. And while all these statements have some truth in them, I want us to see today that there is a greater truth that we need to hear. And that greater truth is that the Word, Jesus Christ, became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. He knows our grief, and He knows our pain. There's nothing you can experience He has not already experienced in the flesh. Are you feeling misunderstood? At the, time, at the hour of Jesus' greatest need, when He needed friends the most to pray with Him, and for Him they were asleep. came and woke him up. Hey, I need you guys praying. He couldn't stay awake. Are you feeling rejected? Well, so was Jesus. All his friends left when he was arrested. Read it. A bunch of folks come and arrest Jesus. Everybody scatters. Including big mouth Peter. He said, I don't care what anybody else does. These other jokers can run from you. I'm not running. He ran. And then he denied Jesus. He felt rejection. Are you feeling lonely? Jesus stood trial, accused of things he never did, with no one coming to his defense. Are you feeling mistreated? Jesus, whose only thing he has ever done is love people and tell them the truth. That's all he's ever done. This same Jesus was convicted of something he didn't do, was beaten to appease the crowd, and then was crucified because the religious people could not handle the truth, and he was not guilty of anything except loving the people who crucified him and everybody else. Somebody was driving a nail through your hand, through your arm and placing you on a cross after they had just beaten you and shoved a crown of thorns onto your head, would your prayer for them be, God, forgive them? That was Jesus' prayer. 
Jesus went through all of this to make sure we understood the greatest truth that he understands our pain and he has entered into our pain to bring us salvation and hope. And the truth is that after Jesus endured all of these things, he was raised from the dead. The truth is sin could not defeat him, hell could not handle him, and the grave could not hold him. That's the truth. The greatest truth is that everything Jesus did was because of his great love for you. For you. He did it for you. He didn't have to do it. He chose to do it. And whatever it is you're dealing with in your life, I would like to invite you to allow the truth, to allow Jesus to come into your pain and give you hope. If you're feeling rejected, I'd like for you to allow Jesus to remind you that he accepts you. If you're going to be able to speak to the next generation, you must allow the message of Jesus' love for you to become the truth that you believe and stop buying into Satan's lies. If you are going to be the message, you must first receive the message of God's love into your heart. And then you can speak because... You've got something worth saying. Will you pray with me? Father, so often, so often we are just ignoring the gift of of grace and mercy that you give to all of us. So often, Father, we just choose to, instead of accept the truth, we choose to reject the truth. So often, Father, we, instead of bringing you into our hurt, we choose to push you away from our hurt. Instead of leaning on the one who can give us hope, we to continue to try to do everything on our own and continue to experience hopelessness. Father, I pray right now that all the barriers that we put up between you and us would fall down. I pray right now that they would just come crashing down, just like the walls of Jericho would just be laid to waste and our hearts would be revealed to you and we would open up to you and reveal our hurt and our pain and reveal our emptiness and invite you to come in and fill us up with your love. Maybe that is resonating with some of you right now. Maybe you're watching online or you're here in this room and, and you have tried to do it all on your own. You've tried to bear your own burdens. You've tried to take care of your own hurts and it's just not working out. And It seems like the pain never goes away. And right now you want to receive the truth, the word, Jesus, and invite him into your heart. That's what you want to do. Will you pray this very simple prayer just between you and God? You can remember this prayer with these four very simple words. The first one is sorry. Will you open up your heart and reveal your sorrow to God? Say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for rejecting you up to this point in my life. I'm sorry for pushing you away. I'm sorry for being trying to be my own God in my own life and rejecting you. I'm sorry for all of that. The next word is please. Please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life and please save me and please become the Lord in my life. Please fill me with your love and your spirit. And the last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. Thank you for always being there for me. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you. Father, for everybody who has prayed that prayer for the first time today in a minute, 
I pray, God, that they would continue to lean on you and not on themselves. They would continue to trust in you. And Lord, I know that it can be easy making that decision, but sometimes we let the world come in and try to help us forget that decision we just made to follow you. I pray that doesn't happen to these folks who have made that call. I pray that you'd help them to get to know you better and love you more and that you would continue to work in their lives. I pray for the rest of us that we've been putting up these walls between me and you, between us and you. We've been putting up these walls between us and our families. We've been just keeping everything in instead of allowing Jesus in. We've been pushing him out. Help us, Lord. We need it. In your name I pray. Amen. As we do each week, this altar is going to be open for a time of prayer. If you'd like to spend some time here, I want to invite you to come and do that. If you need me to pray with you, please get my attention. If you don't get my attention, I won't bother you. But if you want me to, I'm here to pray for you. And I'd be glad to do that. I want to invite you as you're able, will you please stand as we sing this next song. This altar is open for you to come.
Uh, I want to invite you to be seated for just a moment of joy. Um, but before I do that, I want to say, you know, whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, you're not alone. God has not left you or forsaken you. He is there for you always. And always remember that. So the moment of joy is I want to invite Reed and Jennifer to come on up here. Uh, these are the Owens. This is Reed and Jennifer Owens. And uh, they have been worshiping with us for a while. And they uh, said, we want to make this official. We want to join uh, Woodbine Church. And uh, I said, well, we'd be glad to have you all. We have some questions we ask everybody whenever they come to join. The first question is, do you know Christ as your Savior? Yeah. Have you been baptized? You believe the Bible to be the Word of God? Will you support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Will you do that? All right. Well, Woodbine, let's welcome our newest members in today. All right. So, all right. I'm going to invite Reed and Jennifer to stand right here for just a moment. After Miss Brenda, she's going to come up and have our closing prayer. After she has our closing prayer, I want to invite you to take just a second, come by, introduce yourself to them, welcome them into the family, and uh, you know, get to know them a little bit, and and y'all, and you'll get a chance to know some of the folks here also. Um, if you're new here and I haven't had the chance to visit with you, we haven't met yet, maybe it's your first time, maybe you've been here several times and we haven't met, I would like to invite you to find me right outside in the atrium, over to the left by the couches, come by and see me, let's talk a little bit, get to know each other a little bit more, and I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you so much for being here, I'm going to turn it to Miss Brenda now. Thank you, Pastor. Also, if you want to get connected here, there's a table out there, please come by and see me, we'll find the perfect spot for you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are awesome. And I thank you that these people come day in and day out to worship you and honor you and honor your ways. God, you're coming, and you want to know if we're going to be faithful. And these people are. So I thank you for what you're about to do, and I ask that we glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great day. I know you by a thousand names And you deserve every single one You've given me a million ways To be amazed at what you've done And I am lost in 